We're not, we're not actually started yet. You're a very well-behaved class here. Usually my classes are much more rambunctious than this. <laughs> well done. And uh, we're going to wait. We're going to wait a second. We're, we're um, uh, live streaming this, so I've got to give the guys in the back the heads up when we're ready to go. Looks like we're about ready to go. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tom Pollard. I'm Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and I'd like to Welcome you all to the Company of Scholars lectures from the Graduate School for this year. This is the first of four lectures uh, that we're featuring this year. Uh, we've got a bit of a theme. You might have to come to all four lectures to figure out what the theme is. Uh, but uh, and I'll tell you about Jacob Hacker, our, our first speaker, in just a moment. On January 22nd, Beverly Gage from the History Department will be speaking on uh, J. Edgar Hoover and his role in the founding of the conservative movement in the United States. On uh, February 19th, Catherine Lothram from uh, Religious Studies is going to be speaking about the role of religion and parenting in the US. She does fantastically interesting things. And then on April 2nd, uh, Paul Tipton from the Physics Department is going to talk about whether the world's public have gotten their money's worth in the search for the Higgs boson, which is a big <laughs> physics project. Uh, in, in Switzerland that he, he works on. Our uh, speaker today is Jacob Hacker. Uh, Jacob uh, received his undergraduate degree from Harvard and his PhD from Yale in the year 2000. He is now a professor of political science and director of the Institute for Social and Policy Studies here at Yale. Uh, Jacob is a prolific author of works dealing with fairness in our democracy, and that's what he's going to be talking about today, I believe. Uh, he's a public figure uh, who was uh, prominently featured in many of the debates about the health care reform. And uh, we're really thrilled to have him lead off our series this year. Uh, we intended to uh, have this lecture uh, at the end of October uh, to sort of energize everybody at the end of the political campaign. But uh, Super Storm Sandy intervened, so we had to literally take a rain check here <laughs> on, on the lecture. Uh, but perhaps uh, now is even a better time for uh, Jacob to share his thoughts on is America, uh, is American politics undermining the American dream? Jacob. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm very pleased to, hear, to be here, and thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Whenever you hear it prominently featured, you should, um, uh, he said I was prominently featured in the healthcare debate, you should substitute viciously attacked. Um, but um, <laughs> that's okay. This is, this is, this is why um, political scientists who get engaged in policy debates need to have thick skin. Um, I want to thank Dean Pollard. I want to thank Robin Ludiser for helping put this together. And I want to uh, mention the Institution for Social and Policy Studies really briefly because this is a, a, a Yale institution dedicated to interdisciplinary work in the social sciences that's really focused on precisely encouraging scholars to do work that's engaged with pressing policy debates. We're doing a lot. Um, I became director of the institution last year. We have a new graduate policy fellows program. If you're a graduate student uh, and interested in public policy, you should look into it. Uh, we're also doing a lot of events. In fact, we're doing one tomorrow jointly with the law school on the fiscal cliff um, for those who are interested. I'm going to um, spare you what you've probably been hearing so much about and actually not talk too much about the fiscal cliff debate today, but I will, I will say a little bit about it. Um, so I'm going to keep my pr preliminary remarks relatively short because I want to be able to delve into some pretty complicated issues in, in about 45 minutes. And um, whenever I'm under these kind of time constraints, I'm reminded of an evaluation that I received when I was a new assistant professor here at Yale. And it began quite promisingly. It said, Professor Hacker, if I had just 15 minutes to live, 
I'd want to spend them in your class. Because that way it would seem like an hour. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, I, do have, I do have one last thanks. Um, I want to thank my co-author, Paul Pearson, with whom I wrote Winner Take All Politics. Um, this is a book um, that has now been out for a couple of years. Um, after a year of, of surfing along in the high 300,000s on Amazon, it was featured on uh, Bill Moyer's uh, new program on PBS uh, and, and managed to momentarily break into the top 30 on the New York Times paperback bestseller list. Thus, according to our pu my publisher, I am now a New York Times bestselling author ever, forevermore. Um, so um, I'll take what I can get. So I, I have been waiting to give this talk for a long time. Uh, Hurricane Sandy, of course, intervened. I'm going to forego showing you the slide that cor correctly predicted every electoral uh, college vote um, because, it, because it was copied from Nate Silver's website. Um, OK. So enough jokes. I want to get to something that's unfortunately a lot darker. Uh, and I will motivate that uh, focus with a, a report, a really excellent point, report that came out from the Pew Research Center a nonpartisan public policy center um, uh, late, uh, earlier this year. The report showed what uh, most of you who have been paying attention to the economy and to our politics know well. That is that this has been an extremely difficult period. Um, and um, it's not just the Great Recession. Um, if you look over the last uh, 20 or 30 years, this has been a period in which uh, middle class wages um, and incomes have grown uh, slowly. Um, I'll show some more on that in a moment. Um, while the economic strains facing families uh, in many cases have increased, most, um, most Americans feel as if uh, inequality has risen, uh, not surprisingly, and most who believe that it has gone up do not think it's a good thing. Um, and you, you know, you, you do, the pollsters uh, are picking up this, um, and perhaps the most, I thought perhaps the most telling moment uh, in recent debate over uh, our governmental institution came when Senator Michael Bennett of Colorado went to the floor and presented a slide that looks something like this. Um, this is the U.S. Congress's uh, approval rating, uh, sandwiched between that of Hugo Chavez and Fidel Castro. Um, I note uh, with some mirth that um, Paris Hilton uh, is, a, is substantially more popular than the contemporary Congress. But you don't have to look at these polls um, to sense the, um, the era of concern. Um, this election was a nasty uh, and difficult fight, one that uh, perhaps provided an inspiring uh, end for half the population or slightly, or slightly more, but which, was, uh, but which came on the heels of a very difficult period in American politics, one that shows no signs of, of changing soon. And I think it's worth stepping back from the debate over tax and budget policies to, to look at the sort of larger, longer term trajectory of the American dream, uh, what I call here the American dream, which is really, by which I mean really the, the basic idea that in the United States, uh, if you work hard, if you play by the rules, um, that you'll be able to um, get ahead and that your children will have a better life than, than you had. Um, and this idea, which is so closely tied up with the idea of the middle class in the United States, has come under um, pretty significant strain. Um, and perhaps the most no notable feature of that strain has been the degree to which there seems to have been a divorce between the incomes and wealth of those at the very top and the rest of Americans. It's really striking, and I'll show some figures in a moment, just how concentrated the economic gains of the last uh, 20 or 30 years have been. The top 0.1% of Americans, so the richest one in 1,000 taxpaying households, have seen their real incomes more than quadruple. Uh, since the 1970s. Um, and, it's, uh, and it's been increasingly difficult for politicians to ignore this, this central change. Um, back in 2006, Hank Paulson, then the Treasury Secretary, said, I think somewhat defensively, growing inequality is simply an economic reality and it's neither fair nor useful to blame any political party. Now, you know, we, 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 we might understand why Paulson was dismissive. Um, uh, he was, of course, defending uh, the administration he led, and there was no doubt which party he meant when he said one was being unfairly or uselessly blamed. But in fact, Paulson's view that this is simply a massive economic transformation, I think, is the common view among 
uh, both popular commentators and scholars who study inequality, at least until recently. Um, it's certainly been the view among those who've been on the winning end of these trends. Uh, back uh, a year earlier, uh, before Paulson's statement in 2005, Sandy Weil said in a New York Times profile, this is the former head of Citigroup, he said, people can look at the last 25 years and say this is an incredibly unique period of time. We didn't rely on somebody else to build what we built. And in this view, the titans of finance uh, who are surfing the waves of this new global economy are simply superstars uh, who've benefited from an enlargement of the market, um, shift towards greater reliance on financial instruments, um, major changes in our society that have rewarded talent um, of the sort that Sandy Weil uh, possesses. So it's worth knowing that before he was deposed as head of Citigroup, there was a plaque on the wall of Sandy Weil's office. It was four feet wide, apparently, uh, wood uh, with a glass cover. And etched in that glass was a picture of Sandy Weil and his name. And below it, it said, Sandy Weil, Shatterer of Glass Steagall. Oh. Now, for those who don't get the inside reference, Glass Steagall was, of course, the New Deal regulations who help, whose repeal helped Citigroup form the ma massive banking behemoth uh, that in turn helped Weil's net worth skyrocket. So politics and government were intimately involved in Sandy Weil's rise, and I'll argue are intimately involved in the rise of the very rich over the last generation more broadly. Now, this isn't a story about one party or a few um, bad apples at the top. It's a deeper story about how our democracy has changed. In, in a sense, it's a puzzle inside a, a riddle, inside a mystery. The puzzle is why American society has become so much more unequal over the last generation, and in this specific way that I've already talked about, the concentration of rewards at the, at the very top. The riddle and is how, as we show in the book, this wasn't just a passive result of natural, inevitable market forces, though forces, market forces played an important role, but also the result of things that our leaders did and deliberately didn't do, to redistribute income and remake markets. And that leads, of course, to the mystery, which is how did this happen, right? Our political system may not do many things well, but one thing it is supposed to do well and been set up to do well is to moderate uh, political forces, to ensure that the middle of the political spectrum and the middle class has political sway. Now, I'd like to provide the whole answer uh, to this, these mysteries, riddles, and puzzles, but I'm not going to be able to. I'm going to give you a sense of some of the clues that Paul and I um, discuss in our book and some of the uh, uh, indictments that we offer. Um, and then I want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about where I think this leaves us uh, in the wake of a fought, t tightly fought uh, election and against a backdrop of a looming fiscal cliff. So the, f the way we think about inequality, I think that we're, we, we are ingrained to think about inequality, is about the have-nots and the haves. Um, those at the bottom uh, who are barely getting by and the rest of Americans. The shift that I want you to make in your thinking that will really help you understand what's happened is to think instead about the have-it-alls at the top and the rest of Americans. Um, we've transformed in the last generation into a society in which economic rewards are much, much more concentrated at the top. Now, I'm going to show you some statistics that really drive this home. They're not from my own work. Uh, they're from interpretations of Congressional Budget Office and IRS data. But, um, but I think they really make things clear. I want to warn you, since I am going to show these charts, that, um, that I have a fondness for statistics. I guess probably with this audience, that's not as big of a problem as it, as it is with some others. But my defense here uh, came from Moyers himself, who once said that it is the mark of an educated man to be deeply moved by statistics. So, <laughs> so I hope you share my passion. OK, I'm not the only one who feels this way. Um, Remember Occupy Wall Street? Um, this uh, uh, rather short-lived but nonetheless explosive uh, political protest uh, featured signs like this one here. Um, since when have we had a political protest that used Congressional Budget Office data to make its point? 
And you can already see here what I'm going to show you in a moment, this remarkable rise in the incomes of the top 1%. And if you're just glancing at this, you'll notice right away that this rise, with the exception of these spikes and declines, which reflect mostly the stock market, uh, is very, uh, is very uh, relatively stable over the last generation. That is, it's been a feature of our politics now for about 30 years. Let me show you this a little bit more um, clearly. So here I'm taking the, the CBO's data um, and going back to 1979, the first year available. And this is just on the left the real incomes um, of these different income groups. So we have the lowest uh, through the top, the fourth, fifth, so that's the 60th to 80th percentile, 20th, per, the bottom 20%, the 60th to 80th. And then I've simply broken the top 1% out of the 80th to 90th percentiles. Since we've been talking about the bottom 99% and the top 1% a lot, this is not uh, very strange. Um, but I should say that at the time I was doing this, that this was actually not as commonly done in a lot of the, the research. And I'll show you that it matters quite a bit. So let's go back to 1979. We're looking at real dollars. These include all public and private benefits as best they can measure them, uh, and federal taxes, though not state and local taxes. Just so you know, state and local taxes have increased a lot. Um, over the last generation, uh, much more than federal taxes, and they're more regressive. So if anything, this would understate the changes that have taken place. So you can see, if you go back to 1979, the top 1% had an average income of, you know, in the $400,000 a year range. Um, and that was much greater than the, the middle fifth over here, which had an average income uh, that was more in the $40,000, $45,000 range. But let's fast forward to 2007. Again, real dollars. If a picture is worth 1,000 words, or in this case, I guess, 1.4 million words, this one is it, right? So what you can see here is really all groups have seen some gains. Um, the gains have been most dramatic uh, at the very top. Um, and I'll say in a moment that this in some ways over, uh, understates the transformation, since uh, for the middle uh, and, and these lower groups, a lot of these gains have been due, due not to rising wages, but to increased family work hours. That's not as true at the very top. So the top 1% has seen, uh, has seen about more than a third of all income gains over this period. And, and really, it's even more dramatic if you look at the 2000s, when over half of all income gains went to the top 1%. But in some ways, this is actually, and it's hard to believe, an, uh, an understatement of how concentrated the games are done. What if we just took this top 1%, this group, uh, rarefied group that we talk about so much, uh, and broke it into um, its various constituent parts? So we can go here from the bottom half of the top 1% all the way up to the top 0.01%. This is nosebleed territory in the income distribution. Um, I think the technical term for this group is the ordinary rich, and the technical term for this group will say the stinking rich. Um, okay, so the top 0.01% to the, the bottom half of the top 1%. Again, 1979, you can see uh, there is uh, inequality among the top 1%. But what's really striking is, again, how concentrated the gains are within the top 1%. Um, so one wonders if the slogan of Occupy Wall Street uh, might have been, or at least maybe if the vice president start watch, wa uh, marching on Washington, we are the 99.9%. .9%. You know, we got a little bit of a taste of this uh, during the presidential campaign. And funnily enough, it was during the Republican primary. Divide, separate, put one group against another. 
Santa Politico analysis that uh, the sheer volume of anti Gingrich ads run by Romney's PAC. If his PAC buys millions of dollars of ads to say things that are false, that's somehow the way Washington plays the game. Isn't that exactly what's sick about this country right now? Isn't that what the American people are tired of? Oh, it's not fair. He's using unlimited money to buy influence, rigging the system in some way. Interesting. I can't imagine how frustrated and helpless you would be. regulation and praising the people with great jobs. All right, your platform. Free markets, deregulation, unmitigated corporate money and politics, handsomeness, distinguished great temples. I spent my life in the private sector, started my own business. I've, I've learned from that. But I learned the lessons of a free economy over 25 years. Corporations are people, my friend. You're, you're mad at Mitt Romney? For God's sakes, it's like Mitt Romney answered the Republicans eHarmony ad and now you're saying it's unfair. <laughs> Okay, so this, this uh, debate during the Republican primaries, I think, really drove home the extent to which uh, there was uh, even debate about the very, very top pulling away f uh, from the rest of, of the rich within the top 1%. Now, I was just going to mention uh, a couple quick things. I, I noted already that uh, much of the gain in um, income for the middle came from increased family work hours. And you can see here that over the last um, 30 years or so, um, that really the gains in productivity, which were relatively um, um, substantial, though slower than they had been in the, in the previous generation, um, were not matched by gains in compensation. Now, there's some issues with the compensation data, but this does include uh, benefits. You can see that it's male workers in particular um, the white line here saw really no, no gains. Now, and this is true actually surprisingly high up uh, the educational spectrum. So, for example, if you look at entry level male workers with a college degree, their income gains over the last 30 years have been relatively modest. Uh, they're less likely, for, uh, for example, to have health insurance at their place of work. Um, so these strains have been, uh, have been actually felt by many Americans who are actually relatively well educated. Um, and moreover, and I think this is the important point, it's hard to reconcile those really sharp gains at the top um, with a model that is focused uh, just on sort of generalized return to education, right? Where um, you would expect that the gains would be much more broadly diffused. Um, so in general then, when people start to look at what's happening at the top, and I'm gonna skip over a couple things that I think are of interest, but uh, I don't want to take up too much time. Um, in general, when you look at what's happening um, at the very top, um, you, you start to question the sort of the story that is emphasizing uh, skill, what, what is often called skill bias technological change by economists. Um, but that's a, that, that's a kind of negative explanation or negative, negative account in the sense that these skill bias technological change arguments don't seem to be wholly consistent with how concentrated the games have, gains have been. I want to pr provide in a moment a much more positive account that sort of attempts to attribute uh, many of these changes to changes in public policy. The last clue in this is that the United States is not unique but quite distinctive in the concentration of income at the very top. So it, you may be aware that 
the economist Emmanuel Saez and his colleagues have put together uh, the best available data, cross-national data, on the concentration of income at the top based on tax statistics. And what they've done uh, is put these together in this, thing, in this uh, source called the World Top Incomes Database. And if you take that data and you look back in the early 1970s, you can see a, a remarkable similarity across rich countries in the, the, the share of income going to the top 1%. I should note that these uh, numbers do not include capital gains, which are very hard to compare across countries. That's a significant oversight, as I'll, as I'll show in a moment. Capital gains are very concentrated at the top, and they're much more prevalent in the United States than in many other rich countries. So again, if anything, these numbers understate the difference between the United States and at least the non-Anglo countries. You can see here, if we go to the, the last year available in the top incomes database, which is not always the same, but it doesn't change the conclusion much, um, you can see here that the United States looks more like the so-called Anglo countries, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, UK, um, and uh, yet even among those countries, the gains at the very top have been much more marked. This number, including capital gains in, in, in 2007 or so, uh, was around 25%, which was the highest point reached since uh, on the eve of the Great uh, Depression. Um, you can see, though, that a number of countries have seen small increases. Um, some have seen almost none at all. Um, the United States really stands out, raising the question again of why, if there's broad technological forces at work across these countries um, at, um, and uh, that are increasing the returns of education, the gains have been so much more concentrated in the United States uh, than in other rich uh, countries. Now, the first answer to this question is if we, these are, most of the figures I've shown you are on pre-tax uh, pre data as with this, but I did show you that figure before, the Congressional Budget Office figure that showed post-tax data. And so obviously the first question you would want to ask is, well, has government played a role in, in, in um, tamping down the inequalities that uh, are occurring in pre-tax data? And the, the Congressional Budget Office has answered this question pretty definitively in a recent report. And you can see here that the United States, over the period of rising inequality, has actually done less to reduce the so-called Gini index through tax, federal taxes and transfers. Whereas the Gini index reduced inequality by almost a quarter, uh, uh, sorry, whereas taxes and transfers reduced the Gini index by almost a quarter in 1979, the number was closer to 17% in 2007, with most of the change occurring because of the less redistributive quality of transfers over that period. But this, is, this suggests that the United States, and, and if you look in comparative relief, uh, it's distinctive, that the United States uh, did less to reduce inequality, um, but it doesn't really answer the question of what happened at the very top. Um, According to the Congressional Budget Office, about half of the rise in the Gini index in the United States is due to income gains at the top. That is, the, the pulling away of the top 1% and the increasing dispersion of income within that. Um, and if we're going to try to understand the role of government in changing inequality in the United States, we're obviously going to have to look beyond uh, just uh, taxes and public transfers, or at least the broad effect of taxes and public transfers. So the first thing to say is that if we're looking at the top, we really need to ask uh, what were the policies that affected the top the most? And the most obvious is tax policy. So if you go back to the 1960s here, and this is from data uh, that comes from Saez and Piketty, um, you can see that income tax rates have come down uh, very sharply at the very top. Um, and most of that, that change, by the way, happens well before the Bush tax cuts of 2001. For the broad uh, just middle of the distribution, you can see there has really been rel no change in the uh, average effective federal tax rate. Um, so this, this is a remarkable change, and it is worth quite a bit to those at the very top. Um, in just between the, the Clinton tax rates of the 1990s uh, and 2007, the average effective income tax rate paid by the top 400 taxpayers, which is a common metric the IRS puts out, declined from around 30% to 16.5%. So when we hear talk about uh, paying, say, only a 14, Mitt Romney paying only a 14% effective tax rate, it's actually not that uncommon among the very richest taxpayers to pay something on that uh, scale. So for the top 400 taxpayers, their average income tax rate 
went down from 30% to 16.5% over this period. That was worth about $46 million for every taxpayer in that top 400 group. So each taxpayer received essentially $406 million because of the decline in tax rates just since the mid-1990s. And there was just a new report out from the IRS showing that uh, these tax rates have continued to fall, particularly as more and more of the income of those at the top is, is received in the form of capital gains, which is taxed at only 15% currently. Um, so according to new IRS data, the average income tax rate for households with income above $10 million, um, that's about the point, top 0.1%, um, fell from 22.4% effective income tax rate to about a 20% effective income tax rate in 2010. Nonetheless, much of the change that we're talking about is before government taxes and benefits. And there's a tendency in the research to assume that that portion of the change in income must be apolitical, must have occurred without the influence of government. But if you think about it for just a moment, that's obviously a very blinkered view of the role of government. Um, after all, governments not only tax and spend, they also regulate and shape the market in profound ways. Um, and, those way, and those ways that they do that can have an enormous effect on the distribution of income in the market even before go government's visible hand reaches in to tax or spend. I made this point. Um, in, Paul and I made it in the, in the book, and then I wrote a paper that I presented in Britain, and the, um, the young uh, aspiring Labor Party leader, uh, Miliband, uh, Ed Miliband, was at the, um, at the conference and was taken by it and started talking about it on the campaign trail. Uh, and it so happened that not within a, a relatively short period of time, I found myself the subject of question time uh, in, um, here we are. Did it die? Now, now, normally, Mr. Speaker, at this stage in the proceedings, I say that the party opposite hasn't got any plans. But on this occasion, I can reassure the House they have got some plans. They've got a, they've got a new plan. It's called pre-distribution. <laughs> I, think, I think that what that means is that you spend the money before you actually get it. And I think you'll find that's why we're the mess we're in right now. It's an, economy, it's an economy that doesn't just work for a few at the top, but works for everyone. And, it, and, it's, and it's not about a prime minister who cuts taxes for millionaires while raising taxes for everyone else. And, and perhaps when he gets up to reply, he can answer the question which he so far hasn't answered. Is he going to be a beneficiary of the 50p tax cut? This is an economy that's generated a million new now I know, I know, I know he doesn't want to, I, I know he doesn't want to talk about pre-distribution, but I've done a little work, Mr. Speaker. I can tell him about his new guru. His new guru is called, I'm not making this up, the man who invented pre-distribution. He's called, he's called, I'm not making this up, Mr. They don't want to hear. Uh, order, the house. <laughs> Order, members on both sides need to calm down. Let's hear the Prime Minister's answer. Yeah. I'm surprised they don't want to hear from their new guru. He's called Mr. J. Hacker. And uh, <laughs> Mr. J. Hacker's recommendation is that we spend an extra 200 billion and borrow an extra 200 billion in this parliament. That is his recommendation. But in the work I've done, I've discovered his new book. It is published by Princeton University Press and it's called The Road to Nowhere. He doesn't need to read it, he's there already. <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, so uh, another uh, you know, deep engagement I received in the public sphere. Um, <laughs> so the. Um, the idea of pre-distribution, um, 
is not, has nothing to do with either the Labor or Conservative Party's platforms. Um, but the idea is basically that there are a lot of ways in which government can shape the distribution of market income. And, and in the book, we talk about several areas, from corporate governance to financial regulation uh, to industrial relations. I think the best example is indeed financial regulation. Um, and if we remember the story of Sandy Weil, we'll, we'll remember that uh, deregulation was a huge part of the lead up to the financial crisis and the huge gains that happened at the top. There's still a, a large amount of debate about the exact role of, of financial de deregulation in the financial crisis. Um, but there's been a number of important pieces of work on this, including this paper by Thomas Philippon and um, Philip Rechef, um, looking at the relationship between financial deregulation and relative wages in the financial industry. Now, the, um, there are two things to note here. One is that if you see here this relative wage, which is the sort of orangish red line here, that, um, the re that, that it tracks almost perfectly the, the U-shaped trajectory of the top 1% over uh, the, the course of the 20th century. Um, that is, there was a large decline in the relative wage in finance after the New Deal regulations and the f stock market crash. And then over the last uh, 20 years or so, 30 years or so, with uh, hand in hand with financial regulation, there's been an increase in the relative wage in finance. What the relative wage is is basically what similarly educated uh, and skilled workers earn in finance uh, relative to uh, workers in other fields. And this is just a, a w another way of saying that for a long time, people in finance didn't earn a lot of money. In the last generation, they have. Now, w this is a c purely correlational relation. Uh, uh, um, uh, relationship here, but you can see here they also construct an index of financial deregulation which tracks um, the, the rise in the financial wage premium quite closely. Um, another, uh, another thing that seems to track what happened in deregulation is financial instability. Um, if you look here, and this is from David Moss of the Harvard Business School, and there's a lot more going on, this is the share of income going to the top 10%. Um, it's very similar to, in terms of its trajectory to the share of income going to the top 1% or that wage premium I just showed you. And then these blue and these red um, lines are just various measures of financial instability, total bank failures or the total deposits of failed and assisted institutions as a share of GDP. And that's reveal, it's revealing that the New Deal reforms seem to put an end to the to repeated endemic financial crises uh, that had occurred prior to the Great Depression. And that it's only in the last... Uh, 30 years in line with uh, deregulation that we've seen more financial instability uh, culminating in the financial crisis uh, of 2008 and 9. Um, you'll see here that because of the increasing consolidation of the financial s uh, sector that actually bank failures are not actually very that high. This is a savings and loan crisis where far more banks failed but the deposits of course under uh, under um, the assets under uh, of failed institutions of course are enormous. And the, um, the, the financial story is a huge part of the story of what's happened to the top 0.1%. In fact, if you look at the tax records of this um, rarefied group, you'll find that about 6 in 10 are corporate or financial executives. About 2 in 10 are financial executives. About 6 in 10, uh, 4 in 10 are corporate executives. So corporate governance is another part of the story that we tell. Uh, in each of these areas, the changes were tied up very much with the increasing role of finance, which in turn was a partially a reflection of shifts in public policy. Bipartisan shifts, I should add, uh, that I'll talk about in, in just a moment. Now, part of this was about changing policy, and so you saw major uh, regulatory changes over this period. But in fact, a lot of it was simply about failing to update policy in the face of changing market structures. And that's another way in which uh, public policy and politics can play an important role in shaping the distribution that we don't pay much attention to. In the book, we call this drift. And drift is simply when, po when the world changes, but policy doesn't, in ways that are intended uh, by key actors. And drift is most notable and most, um, and most political in many ways when it involves the blocking activity of very powerful private actors. And this was certainly the story in finance. There's a great uh, moment or great moment for us uh, in the debate over accounting law changes when uh, the head of the SEC went to the then chair of the banking committee, Phil Graham, and asked for some updates of policy. Graham looked at him, and I'm not going to try to do the Texas accent, and said, 
Um, unless the waters are crimson with the blood of investors, I don't want you engaging in any regulatory flights of fancy. Um, so here was a clear case in which a very powerful private actor, situated private uh, uh, political actor, was standing in the way of regulatory updating. We see this again and again over this period because the, uh, the industry interests were so much more energized and organized around these issues. Look at Sandy Weil putting so much more money into politics than they ever had uh, and were so much more capable uh, of taking advantage of the increasing incapacity of American political institutions to act on a lot of issues. And that's, that's I'm going to move now to talking about some of the larger political changes uh, that took place. So of my three, um, three opening questions, uh, what, was the, what was the nature of the change? What were some of the policies that played a role? And why did government do it? What, what were the political, what's the political story behind it? I want to turn to this last question before uh, offering some broader reflections. So if the, if the winner-take-all economy, if this rise was made substantially in Washington, that really raises a fundamental puzzle. Um, it's, um, it's, again, easy to see why government will often cater to large um, majorities um, that are intense in their preferences, but it's harder to, to, to think about why would you get uh, policies over a long period of time that, were, that had such a concentrated set of beneficiaries. Um, how could this happen in a democracy that's so often seen as so responsive to middle class concerns? You know, we can see some politics, uh, some, and I think one of the aspects of it that I think we have to understand is that it's been harder and harder, as I was just uh, hinting, for our political institutions to act at all. And, and perhaps the most um, important reason for that is the rise of the Senate filibuster. Now, for all of those who've seen Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, we have this image in our mind of the filibuster uh, as this great uh, storied institution where senators go to the floor and debate for hours on end. At the time that this movie was made, the filibuster was actually extremely rare, and it did take this form. It was not used usually by, um, by people seeking such lofty ends as uh, Mr. Smith, was, but by Southern racists seeking to um, prevent civil rights legislation. But nonetheless, it was rarely used, uh, and it was used typically by intense minorities that were willing to pay the price of going to the floor and debating for long, long periods of time. Um, that has changed dramatically. The filibuster, and this is cloture filings to end Senate filibusters, as you can see, it was relatively rare up until this period of uh, that we've seen this last generation. Uh, and you can see that it's even concentrated within that period really over the last uh, few years. So uh, since the, if you look at the 40 years before 1970, um, there were um, fewer than 40 cloture filings across that entire period. In the 40 years after, uh, there's been more than 800 cloture filings. And in just the, the, two, the four years leading up to 2010, uh, there were more than uh, 200 uh, cloture filings alone. Uh, and that's shown no sign of declining in the last two years, I should note, it, if you had any question. Um, James Madison, uh, uh, you know, we, we tend to think of this as a constitutional, an aspect of our constitutional government, but the, the filibuster is really an aspect of Senate rules that has no mention in the Constitution, and in fact, uh, really runs against the grain of many of the majoritarian sentiments of the founders. Here's James Madison saying that uh, with the exception of a few areas designed to uh, in, uh, sort of create separate institutions sharing powers like the veto, uh, having the majority uh, be overruled by the minority violated the fundamental principle of free government. And uh, the, re the result of this rise in the use of the filibuster both reflects and has abetted rising partisan polarization within Congress, about which I'm sure you've heard a lot. I'll show you just one result of that. Um, this is the number of laws passed per session of Congress. And you can see that, um, that this last Congress uh, really stands out. Uh, in fact, I think it's the least productive Congress since the middle of the late uh, of the last uh, of the 19th century. Um, just by way of comparison, that's the do-nothing Congress that Harry Truman <laughs> talked about. It passed 903 laws as compared with about 170 uh, in the last Congress. So inaction is an important important part uh, of the story. Um, the, sorry, 
The other aspect of the story about which we've heard a lot lately is the transformation of the organized interest environment around government. And so it's not just that it's harder uh, for uh, political leaders to act, but also that um, they're facing much greater organized pressure uh, on many policy issues than they were a generation ago. Um, the story we tell in our book is really of the, the, of the sort of massive counter-mobilization of organized corporate interests uh, in the 1970s um, around issues of regulation. Um, there was a real backlash in the corporate community against uh, Ralph Nader and against some of the really huge regulatory changes that were pursued under Richard Nixon, such as the EPA. Um, and that led into a major mobilization around both lobbying and uh, campaigns. Um, and I mentioned lobbying first because lobbying is where corporations really put their money. The typical company spends about 10, 10 times, that, that spends money on politics, spends about 10 times as much uh, on lobbying as they do on campaigns. And they're spending a lot more than they were a generation ago. They're also spending a lot more on campaigns. We've seen that um, in the last election. Um, but sometimes it's forgotten just how dramatic the shift has been. Um, in real dollars, it's remarkable how little was being spent on elections 20 or 30 years ago. Now, in this, last, in this last election, and I think in 2008, you could argue that a lot of the money was used uh, for ends that we might support, like mobilizing voters. The point is, though, that the, the role of money has dramatically increased over this period, and the need to get it uh, through various means is much greater for politicians than it has ever been. And in both those respects, I think we can, there's an asymmetric effect on the two major political parties. Um, and that's, I think, a hugely important aspect of the political debates today and of the debates that were, that, uh, that have, uh, and the policy changes that led to, uh, to these shifts that I've been talking about. Um, for the Republican Party, this dramatic transformation has been uh, the, the rise of money, the rise of lobbying, the mobilization of the corporate community has been emboldening, right? It has pushed Republicans to identify more strongly with many of their core principles and policy goals, most notably tax cuts. Um, for, the, for Democrats, the changes have been uh, much less clear uh, and much more cross-pressuring um, because for Democrats, they have seen simultaneously uh, the rise in uh, corporate lobbying and of, of contributions coming from the business sector, but also have been torn between that and their, their dwindling uh, labor base, uh, which has lost enormous ground over this period. And so you see this, I think, in a lot of things, but perhaps most notably, you see it in the remarkable asymmetry uh, in the polarization of the two parties. Now, Whenever we talk about polarization, I think we assume that it's symmetrical because, after all, in political science, the assumption is that the two parties are competing for the middle and that the party that deviates farthest from the center, absent a shift in where the middle is, is going to lose elections. But in fact, the most clear implication of much of the, of the research that's been done by political scientists is that polarization has actually been quite dramatically asymmetrical, with Republicans moving farther to the right uh, than Democrats have moved uh, to the left. Now, I think that's related uh, to the remarkable shifts in the organizational universe that I've been talking about, the decline of middle class uh, organizations like labor unions and cross-class civic organizations, the rise uh, of, of uh, lobbying and, and corporate organization. But I think it's also notable that it's probably driven also by the much different kinds of activist bases within the two parties and the better effectiveness of the Republican Party it, if you look at, say, Grover Norquist, uh, or America, uh, or the um, uh, Club for Growth at using sort of recruitment and certification processing and auditing processes to try to discipline Republican members of Congress, particularly through primaries. Whatever the exact balance of explanations, um, we really see it in the numbers. And these numbers come from a remarkable effort by two political scientists, uh, Keith Poole and Howard Rosenthal, um, to chart the ideological landscape of American politics based on members' votes. Now, I'm going to use these numbers in a, in a somewhat, um, uh, I don't know if unorthodox is the right way, but um, to keep with the, the, that metaphor, it's perhaps not the most kosher way to use these. I'm going to start with the levels of, the average levels in the 1970s for the, for the two parties, and then 
look at how the parties have evolved over uh, the last uh, 35 years or so. The, the, the reason why this is not entirely kosher is that there is no natural base for these numbers. Um, it turns out that over the whole of congressional history, the, the mean is zero. Um, and also, they're hard to compare over very long spans of time, although they try to anchor them with members uh, who are overlapping in time. So let me show you the numbers, and you'll, you'll see that it really doesn't matter because uh, they could be off by a very large order of magnitude, and the story would be the same. Okay, so if you look at House Democrats, um, they become about 22% more liberal. Again, all the caveats. Um, House uh, Senate Democrats have become a little bit more liberal uh, on these DW nominate scores, uh, on the economic uh, dimension of American politics, which is the main dimension, according to Poole and Rodenthal. Senate Republicans, on the other hand, have become about 73% more conservative, according to this, and it will not surprise you to see a massive increase in the conservative House Republicans. If you take these DW nominate scores and map them onto congressional history, you get a figure that looks like this. This may be the single coolest figure that I've found in American politics. It's also completely unintelligible unless uh, I explain it. But let me just tell you that these different shades of red and blue indicate how conservative the members are. This shows you entrances of new cohorts. So here you get a class of moder a sort of middle of, the a middle of the Republican road Republicans. In recent years, you can see more and more of the Republicans who've come in have been on the right side of the spectrum. This, for example, is Paul Ryan here, who's a very conservative uh, Republican. And you can see the story is not the same on the Democratic side. Um, that is to say, there has been much more, uh, there have been many more centrist and, uh, and sort of moderate left uh, Democrats and there have been centrist and moderate right uh, Republicans. Uh, you can actually get this figure, and I'll, if you're interested, I'll, I'll, I'll provide the link. It goes all the way back to the founding of Congress. Few of us have any sense of what the, um, the re relative influx of Whigs uh, and Federalists means today, but for recent American politics, this picture tells us a lot. Um, it tells us, first of all, these parties have been remarkably well balanced and that the Republican Party has seen since the mid-1990s, 1994 to be exact, a very large influx of very conservative Republicans. The political science Sean Theriol uh, has calculated that almost all of the polarization of American politics, this is remarkable, is due to what he calls the Gingrich senators. That is, uh, and, and, the, and, House, and House Gingrich, uh, the, G sorry, all the polarization of the Senate is due to what he calls the Gingrich senators, which is actually conservative House Republicans who've moved over to the Senate side. This is one reason, and then I promise I will wrap up. This is one reason why those who say gerrymandering uh, couldn't play any role in this story might be wrong, because if the House, um, if the House is seating the, the, the very conservative uh, Republicans over to the Senate, or, or liberal Democrats, um, that's one of the ways in which uh, uh, gerrymandering or other House-centered explanations of increased polarization might spill over onto uh, the Senate. So the, this polarization uh, raises a question of whether you see something comparable in uh, public opinion. And I'll just say that there is very little sign of overall polarization of the public. That is, measures of dispersion do not show a big increase in polarization. On social issues, both sides of the political spectrum have actually moved substantially uh, to the left over the last generation. On economic issues, it's a much more stable picture. Um, but we do see, and this is what I mentioned before, there is a conservative activist base that's more intense uh, than you see on the, Republican, on the Democratic side of the aisle, and that may be an important part of the story. But I think it's an important part of the story that actually brings us back to the, um, to the fundamental issue that I raised before. Um, what we've seen over the last generation is, um, is a shift in policy that has actually been um, in a, uh, quite inegalitarian. Right? Inequality has gone up in the market in part because of policy changes I've discussed. Um, and in addition, uh, market changes in inequality have not been matched by policy shifts that have pushed back against that rising inequality. Um, a lot of that has been driven by inaction rather than action, and a lot of that inaction is driven by polarization and the rising increase in the use of the filibuster. And the reason that I believe that this uh, partisan story is linked in many ways is that if you start to look at public views about inequality, about public policy, what you find is a much more complex view um, than you get from the kind of popular accounts of, um, of welfare states supporting Democrats on the one hand and highly conservative uh, Republicans on the other. 
There's a, uh, there was a famous article in the, 19th, uh, in, the, in the 1960s that argued that Americans were operational, uh, cons uh, li uh, sorry, philosophical conservatives and operational liberals. That is, they were philosophically worried about government but loved everything that government did. Um, and in fact, you find even among Tea Party supporters very strong support uh, for many core public programs. At the same time, even among Democrats, you find concern that we're not addressing uh, say, uh, some of the uh, festering fiscal problems of our country. Um, the point is that in many ways, I think, the story of the last generation is of politics has been pulled away uh, from the middle class and, um, and driven uh, increasingly by uh, uh, elite activists. Um, the role of money in American politics, and perhaps most pervasive, the, the increasing incapacity of our political system to act uh, uh, it, at all. Now, this may sound like an extremely depressing uh, story, um, but I don't see it as that. Um, I think that if the depressing story in many ways is the one that we so often hear, that this is only about globalization and technological change, that our government really can do very little to deal with it. Um, if Politics is a very important part of the, 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 the increasing strains facing middle class Americans, then politics can be part of the solution as well. I do not, um, I do not want to pretend that, uh, that addressing these problems would be easy. Uh, we're not going to revamp our constitution, but I think we could uh, at least have a few clear priorities that are drawn out of some of the analysis that I've offered today. First, we should be doing what we can to reduce or resist barriers to policy updating. And I think filibuster reform is an important part of that task. Second, we should be trying, insofar as possible, to reduce the ability to translate money into power. Um, the essence of American democracy, as, as the two Roosevelts famously said um, at, at different points in time, is the uh, ideal of political equality. And that rests on having some, some kinds of flood walls. Uh, between the market and democracy. Inequality in our society is one thing. Uh, having that inequality translate into political inequality is quite another. And fine, finally, I think, and there's maybe a hopeful sign in this last election, that we should be striving not necessarily for a more parliamentary system, um, even though that's what our political structure has increasingly become with unified parties um, fighting it out, but for a more majoritarian system one in which the uh, majority preferences on things like higher tax cuts, uh, tax rates on the very well off, uh, should be able to, whenever possible, uh, and not inconsistent with other uh, uh, critical rights, uh, dominate. Um, and when you look at the polls, uh, what you find is that for most Americans, they do not feel that the middle class has that kind of influence. A poll that was done uh, at the at the, during the height of the fight over health care and financial reform, a time when the government was, was really grappling with issues um, of critical concern to middle class Americans, I think drives home the sense of cynicism that many Americans feel. You can see here that when asked whether government economic policies had helped large banks and financial institutions a great deal, 53% of Americans agreed with that. Um, but when asked if they were helping middle class people or small businesses, only about 2% of Americans agreed a great deal. Um, so there's a sense among many Americans that the system is not working well to represent the middle class. Uh, and I think that some of the reforms that I'm talking about uh, might address that concern. So thank you. OK, I'm look, looking forward to having some questions and answers from Jacob. And I'm going to ask Jacob to repeat the question so that the people on the live stream video will know what the question was. Please. Great. Yes, hi. Um, I have sort of a couple questions related about the, the politics mm -hmm. of this situation. Because it, it strikes me that on this thing where, you, as you said, that Americans are philosophically conservative but operationally liberal, and it has struck me over the last few elections that Americans are not really voting for politicians who are actually going to enact the policy preferences that they themselves, the, the electorate, says that they would like. Um, and, and I want to know to what extent you think the following two things are causes of that. One is, one is the ignorance of most Americans about uh, 
where basically where tax money comes from and where it goes. I mean, you ask you you ask Americans questions about about where you know who pays the who pays what in taxes and how income is distributed and what their tax dollars go to pay for, and they have no idea. Um, they think welfare is a ton of it. They think foreign aid is a ton of it. Those are actually very small. Um, Hard to be brief. But and, and, the, has and, 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 the, and the other and the other thing is people voting for candidates rather than parties in an increasingly polarized um, in, in an increasingly polarized political system. Voting for, for example, Barack Obama and Scott Brown in Massachusetts, where I'm from. Mm -hmm. Good question. Okay, so the question is basically, I, I see it as being about to what extent is this due to um, people not neither either not recognizing or not voting on the basis of their their interest um, and um, and to what extent um, and how do we understand uh, the causes of that uh, in our contemporary political environment? You know, I mean, since Thomas Frank's "What's the Matter with Kansas," this may be like one of the most common questions that I ever get, um, and. Um, and I think there's obviously some truth to Frank's argument. Um, if you look at working class Democratic voters, the ones who've been, uh, uh, sorry, working class white voters who've been really battered uh, by the economy over the last generation, uh, they've dropped, their support for Democrats has dropped by about 20 percentage points. Now, we saw in this last election that other voters uh, have, can offset uh, that decline in support, but it raises some pretty fundamental questions like, what are they thinking, right, um, given uh, the priorities of the two parties? And I would just say um, that I want to make two, two, two points. I want to actually uh, say that, first of all, the, the ignorance uh, and lack of information about policy or politics is definitely nothing new in American politics. Since we started doing polling, we've always been struck by how little people know. And, uh, and, um, and, and, and there's been ingenious arguments by political scientists to, to argue that that doesn't really matter. Um, because of the aggregation properties of elections and also because of uh, the role of organizations and elites. And I think one part of the story that I'm telling is really that those kind of intermediate organizations um, that once worked on a regular basis to try to help people get engaged with political issues and help them uh, navigate uh, political debates uh, have really atrophied. And so we see this most clearly with working class whites. Those who are members of unions uh, are much more likely to vote for Democrats, uh, holding everything else constant. You might say, well, that's obvious why they would, because the unions and the Democratic Party are closely aligned. But I think another thing is, and we see this in lots of studies, and, and in particular with turnout, uh, that unions play an important mobilizing and educative role. Um, whether we think unions are the right institutions to do it, they are perhaps the only institution that consistently did it for workers of modest means over the last uh, generation. Um, but I would say, and it's, this is, I think, really important, that we don't um, overstate the extent to which um, um, Americans are expressing a set of views that are highly consistent with these policy outcomes. And it's really a question of understanding why it is that they uh, come to hold those views. In fact, if you look across three or four major debates today, uh, the priority of, uh, of, of trying to uh, uh, deal with joblessness as opposed to the deficit, um, whether or not we should raise taxes on the very top, whether we should cut Social Security and Medicare or the military. On each of those, um, Americans want to cut the military, not Social Security and Medicare, just so you know. Um, on each of those, we actually see policy departing um, pretty starkly um, from what the majority of, of Americans um, say they want. Um, and you don't have to, um, there's a bunch of research that's been done on this. This is probably the most interesting. This comes from a new book by Marty Gillins. What he looks at is the probability that if a policy is supported by different income groups, um, and he uses thousands of public opinion polls, whether it will actually uh, be enacted uh, it, subsequently. Um, now, the first thing you should see here is that this, the top of this graph is 50%. So even things that have 90, 90 you know, overwhelming support from the richest, most educated people do not clear the 50% uh, chance of getting passed. So it's still a coin, it's about a coin flip for, for things that are supported by this group. But what you can see here is that there's a very clear gradient. Um, and he does not suggest that this has changed dramatically over time in the interest of full disclosure. Um, and I'm, uh, he looks at one earlier year and then most of his data is from the last 20 years. So. Um, so it's not clear whether this has changed, but there, this and work by Larry Bartels, a political scientist at Vanderbilt, 
that work suggested there's a problem of middle class responsiveness as well as a problem of middle class uh, confusion. And so I would think that um, the first place to focus um, in, in thinking about how to make our political system work better is to try to figure out why it seems so weakly responsive um, even to people in the middle of the income distribution when their preferences are not consistent with those at the top. Yes, right here. This was uh, a measly re-election. I mean, it was much more significant than W's re-election, first of all. Four and a half million more popular votes. So th the other side keeps on living in this alternate reality or in this ignorant world. And so how are we going to gap this disinformation uh, canyon, if you will? I mean, I don't, I, I'm not very hopeful about do you see any signs that you are going to bridge that gap at some point? Well, I mean, I think that. Um, so the question is basically, you know, if if uh, conservatives may be living in a bubble of their own creation of late, and and I and the question is, is that going to change? And, and there are certainly some very vocal um, um, Republicans, David Frum, uh, for example who've argued that this is a big problem. And in some ways, right, the, the way in which our political system generally is supposed to discipline parties is to, it's when they lose elections, uh, they're forced to sort of reckon with aspects of their, um, their stance that, um, that are not popular. In this case, I do think that around issues of immigration, uh, and to support of Hispanic voters, there has been more attention within the party. For example, they immediately rushed out their version of the DREAM Act, uh, which I think is the ACHIEVE Act, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yours is a dream and ours is an achievement. Um, but, um, but on this central question about sort of uh, what's the stance that um, they should take towards tax cuts, um, they've, been, uh, they've been much more reluctant to shift. Uh, apparently, the Republicans put out an offer today for $800 billion uh, in tax cuts over 10 uh, for increased revenues over 10 years through unspecified deductions and loophole closing, um, which is about half of what the president is calling for. But also, I think, if you look at the ideas out there for capping deductions, it's pretty unrealistic, uh, especially if we're going to preserve the, the charitable uh, deductions. So it's really, there's a good question of whether or not the, the party um, has seen the writing on the wall in this, in this budget debate. Now, the fact is, the, the, what we would call in political science the reversion point in the debate is all the tax, taxes, uh, the, the Bush tax cuts disappear, right? So there's a pretty strong mechanism uh, for pressing them to the table. Um, and, uh, and I think that we'll, we'll, see, we'll see much more movement uh, of the Republicans. I mean, the de uh, President Obama has taken a fairly f uh, different stance uh, in this debate than he did in 2011 over the debt ceiling. I think the, probably the biggest wild card right now with regard to the fiscal debate uh, fiscal cliff debate is really whether or not um, the Democrats can get the debt ceiling issue resolved because that's looming very soon in the future after the fiscal cliff. Um, I think that the, the, there are two, if you looked at the polling, the internal polling uh, of the Republicans, um, they really overstated their standing. I mean, there, there's a lot of stories uh, about this. It's not entirely clear how much they were fooled and how much they were just trying to fool the news media. But it may well be that, um, that there's a real cost to this kind of insularity at this particular juncture. Um, but I think we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't forget that if the forces that were driving that shift I was talking about were not primarily voter forces, then the, the disciplining or the sort of corrective mechanisms may be fairly weak. So if it is indeed that Grover Norquist and his No New Taxes Pledge may loom much larger for these Republicans than, say, swing voters, then um, it's going to be a while, and it's going to be a, a, a tough, a, a, a tough uh, and difficult process. And it would probably take you know, it's probably going to take um, more uh, electoral battle scars. 
And, and you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, midterm elections have played out very differently than presidential elections over the last decade or so. Much smaller, uh, more conservative electorate tends to be more white and older. And so, and Republicans have also done fairly well at insulating themselves in the House. They got, the, they got a, you know, slim minority of the popular vote, but managed to pretty handily hold on to all of their seats. So there's a degree to which that House Republican caucus is going to be pretty entrenched for some time to come. Yeah. Uh, right there. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, so um, you mentioned the fact that the percent of income that is paid taxes by the top one percent and point one percent has really fallen to below eighteen percent, and yet there's all this discussion in the current debate about changing the top rates from thirty six to thirty nine, etc. But it seems like almost all those people could not be paying even the thirty six. <laughs> So one thing is, of course, capital gains. Yeah, that's a big and thing. And the other thing is uh, structures in the tax code that only they can avail themselves of because you know, we, we see what the hedge fund guys are doing uh, to not pay taxes. Um, so I haven't heard that mentioned. And what I'm worried about is there's going to be a huge sellout where you know they're going to, you know, on fairly wealthy doctors and professors, <laughs> your taxes are going to go up. Right. And the people that are the super rich that you're emphasizing that, that are actually uh, monopolizing the resources, uh, will, it'll just fly under the radar because you know they, they won't raise the capital gains rates. And, and, and so. It's a good good concern. So, so the question is basically. In the current policy debate, um, we're talking about raising the top two tax rates. Obviously, those tax rates are paid, you know, by uh, for on every dollar of income above the the, the filing threshold. Um, so it would it would hit those in the top 0.1 percent relatively hard, but it wouldn't hit the top 0.1 percent as hard as some other changes that really. Um, really dealt with some of the special provisions that seemed to be worth the most to the very, very well off. And the two most important that were mentioned were the capital gains, uh, the, the low rate on capital gains. I would also mention dividends, um, uh, both of which uh, date from uh, the Bush tax cuts. Actually, the capital gains tax came down. 1986, Reagan sets capital gains tax at the same rate as the tax on labor income. It's a remarkable moment, right? It's actually, historically, there's been a lower rate on capital gains, but in 1986, as part of a compromise, we basically taxed capital gains as ordinary income. In 1997, it came down. Today, it's, and then again, in the Bush tax cuts, today, it is 15%. And this has a, remor I mean, it has a much larger effect than you might think, because the change in the who's at the top uh, is really important. As I said, six in 10 of the top 0.1% are corporate and financial executives. These are people who have enormous amount of influence over the form their compensation takes, right? And so they're shoving more and more of it into capital gains, as you would if your capital gains was being taxed at 15%. The hedge fund managers are a special case because of an interpretation of the tax code that is clearly wrong uh, but needs le legislative change to be altered. Um, they get to treat uh, much uh, a significant share of their earnings, um, basically money that's under management but not their own, uh, the fees they get from that as capital gains and thus pay a 15% tax rate as well. So the question was really, is there, why isn't there more discussion of a focus on sort of that, um, that pr those particular uh, things? And I would say the estate and the gift tax are another aspect of it. Um, and I would just say something that I think is very little recognized is that in most of the recent tax cut debates, the story you tell, which is sort of basically trying to shift the burden from the, the, the stinking rich to the ordinary rich, has been a big part of Republicans' aims. And you might say it's either, you could say it's driven by this need to build a kind of uh, moneyed base for the party, or, or it could be driven by the conviction that these are the job creators and the risk takers. Whatever the reason in the debate over the estate tax, in, the, in, the, in, in taking the opportunity after the 2002 midterm to add the dividend tax cut. In each of these cases, these were very concentrated benefits, like economic smart bombs for the very, very, very well off. Um, and so to reverse that would require, I think, there, be, there need to be two things. One would be uh, uh, serious reform of, of the capital gains tax um, treatment. And, and I, think, you know, I think you could find common ground here around the idea that uh, that we should have spe maybe special treatment of long-term capital gains, but a lot of capital gains is essentially just income in another, you know, ordinary labor income in another form. Um, and it was worth noting that the president, that in the Republicans in saying we want $800 billion in loophole closing and explicitly ruling out tax rate increases are ruling out the president's increase in the capital gains tax 
in his, he does tax carried interest in his proposed $1.6 trillion proposal and in uh, the estate and gift tax, which he wants to return to the 2009 levels. So this is really, in some ways, what the debate is about. But the president's proposal, according to the Tax Policy Center, would raise about half of its um, total $1.6 trillion from the top 0.1%, uh, and about 75% from the top 1%. If you did a deduction cap that was at the level that would be required to raise $1.6 trillion, which is, I think, going to be below $25,000 itemized deduction cap, maybe $17,000, essentially you would have about a quarter paid by the top 0.1% uh, and about a half paid by the top 1%, and a lot would be paid by the sort of upper middle class, right? Because there's no way, there's just not enough deductions and credits at the very top. So I actually am surprised the extent to which this has not been a kind of talking point. I think the president is trying to avoid making this seem like, oh, you know, raising taxes on those at the top is, is you know, a form of, of you know, class warfare or spite. But the truth is, is that the, the, the Republicans are um, in standing for this idea that loophole closing is the only way you can raise revenue are, in fact, really holding, are really protecting the very, very well off. And probably that's <laughs> where I have to end. Okay. Jacob, thank you very much for this illuminating and interesting discussion. And I'd like to invite you all to join us at a reception in the common room next door and to join us in September and March and April for the next three lectures in this series. Thank you for coming. You said September, March, and April. Oh.